Hi, I'm Jessie Lee McIsaac, a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Early Childhood and Director of the Early Childhood Collaborative Research Centre. Today, myself and my colleague, Dr. Missy Rossiter, an Associate Professor at the University of Prince Edward Island and a Registered Dietitian, are going to be talking about responsive feeding in early childhood. We know that creating healthy food environments for young children is important in fostering healthy behaviour to provide a foundation for lifelong health. Responsive feeding helps to encourage self-regulation in children by allowing children to communicate their feelings of hunger and is followed by an appropriate response from the caregiver. Early childhood programs often follow healthy eating guidelines or regulations that guide what foods are served and often also provide responsive feeding principles around the environments we create for children. Today, we are going to share five key strategies to enhance responsive feeding practices in early learning programs. This video is a prequel to a webinar that we will be hosting next week. So the first um, strategy that we're going to talk about is really around respecting a child's expression of satiety or a sense of being full. So children are born with the ability to recognize hunger and satiety and the capacity to self-regulate their intake of food. So this capacity to self-regulate their energy intake is supported when children are verbally cued to their hunger and satiety. Yet, as parents, caregivers, and educators, we can override young children's internal cues of hunger and satiety by doing things like controlling their food intake, restricting their food, or using food to reward and encourage behavior. So pressuring children to eat the, um, the one more bites, the finish your food, you're not leaving the table until you finish, those kinds of comments, uh, using food to encourage behavior, uh, so eat your peas, uh, or you don't get dessert, or you were so great on the playground sharing your toys, here's a sucker, those kinds of behaviors, along with controlling children's portions or having attitudes and beliefs that can encourage children to overeat. These are all what we would call non-responsive feeding behaviors. And while they're often well-intended, uh, pressuring children to eat or offering a reward for eating a certain food can really have a negative effect on a child liking a particular food item. Um, and we see that in the longer term, it can create a positive association with the food rewards and the potential for unhealthy or overindulgent eating behavior. So recognizing internal hunger and satiety cues will really help to cultivate skills of optimal self-regulation and self-control, so that sense of confidence around food. Um, longer term, responsive feeding practices can foster healthy eating habits and growth, as well as reduce child under or over nutrition. So a number of practical strategies to help children uh, recognize and, and respect their hunger and satiety signals will be discussed further in our webinar next week. So the second strategy is to allow time to explore new foods. So we want to encourage exploration uh, of foods, new foods, especially with children. Um, and we know that allowing adequate time for children to eat is important. Children eat slow, often painfully slow. Um, but having that time and allowing food to be fun at this age is important. So children are learning and they may need extra time with new foods or foods that are unfamiliar to them. We also know that picky eating is common and normal. Um, it can be frustrating and annoying, but it is a developmentally appropriate. Um, and this exploration uh, is also helpful for, again, just becoming familiar with new foods. And exploration might look like smelling or squishing foods or maybe even just lining up new foods or different few foods. So cues could be, um, you know, these carrots are crunchy or which carrot makes the loudest crunch. Uh, other things like these grapes are so juicy today, which ones are juicier, the red ones or the green ones? Um, children become familiar with foods um, and the textures with this sort of learning to kind of play with food um, and without the pressure of having to either eat it or even taste it. So allowing uh, food to be fun and letting children encouraging that exploration with smelling uh, and touching or again playing. The third strategy or tip is to celebrate all foods. So the premise here is there maybe are no good or bad foods. 
food uh, we know is absolutely critical to nourish our little children, um, but food's also used to celebrate uh, and to come together. So often in um, many of the healthy guidelines or the nutrition policies that we see for early learning centers, uh, food is used as a symbol of community and kinship. Um, and, and so we want to have a little bit of caution around how we talk about certain foods, really trying to move away from the concept of a good or a bad food. If we're consistently vilifying a certain food, or if we talk about how certain foods are good or bad or junk, um, you know, maybe a child really likes that kind of food. Uh, so over time, they start to think, you know, a lot, I like that food, but that food is bad. Am I bad? Those kinds of thoughts. As well, maybe that's the only kind of food that is available at home for a child as well. So we, we want to be careful. Uh, counter to that, sometimes forbidden foods become very desirable. So uh, I never get that food. So when I do, I, I want to overindulge. The ultimate goal is we want children to develop a healthy relationship with food. So neutralizing foods um, or having a bit of a level playing field, removing that hierarchy of different foods can sometimes remove the power that certain foods have as well. Fourth strategy is around role modeling, sitting down for conversation about food and other things as well. Role modeling is a powerful tool for shaping behavior. We know this to be true in all areas, and it's no different with food or feeding. So seeing educators or caregivers eat the same food as children is important, um, but also just the way role models talk about food can be important as well. Mealtime is an opportunity to engage with children and learn about, um, you know, that red juicy apple or that stringy meat that we just had and maybe how it got, how it got there, how it got from the farm to the table. But mealtime is also an opportunity for learning things, table, table etiquette. Uh, you know, Johnny, can you please pass me that fork or, oops, you spilled your milk, let's clean that up together. So again, mealtime is an opportunity to discuss food, but also a chance to work on um, emotional regulation as well. Our final tip revolves around the food environment in general. So here we often try to promote things like family style serving, and this is where children serve themselves from a common dish. Um, it, it can be challenging, so uh, things get messy and from a food safety perspective, or even um, you know, more recently with COVID, there are barriers to family style serving, but we know that it's important to reinforce uh, autonomy in children. So allowing a child to decide how much goes on their plate really does help to um, uh, strengthen that notion of self-regulation uh, um, and self-efficacy around food. And it doesn't always go smoothly. Sometimes, you know, there will be mistakes and there'll be learnings along the way, but that's important as well. Another piece of the food environment is allowing children to become involved with the mealtime. So uh, again, many barriers, but helping in the kitchen helps to build that food skills set that we like to see children have. Setting the table, uh, they can clear the dishes, and while these are sort of seemingly small tasks, they can be important to build interest and those lifelong food skills. The final piece around the food environment is setting a predictable meal time. This typically isn't an issue in childcare, but children who know or who can predict when their next meal or mealtime opportunity for food is, they really feel comfortable to make that decision on the current food offering. So if a child knows that, okay, this is a maybe a morning snack or an open snack, um, I, I can predict or I know that in a short period of time I'm going to have lunch so I can make decisions around do I want a little bit of food or any food at all. Th those kinds of decisions are, are mine to make. Um, and that's where, at, again, particularly in earlier centers or childcare or, or family day homes, um, the, the, what kinds of food are offered is decided by the adults and if the child eats or how much they eat is the decision uh, that lays with the child. So those are the five tips um, that we wanted to share or strategies that we wanted to share with you today. Recognizing a child's hunger and satiety, allowing time to explore new foods, celebrating all foods, uh, really moving away from that good or bad food offerings, uh, role modeling and sitting with children to talk about food and other things as well. And then the food environment, an environment that allows children to um, serve themselves, encourages children to contribute to the meal and has predictable meal schedule. Responsive feeding practices are important because they reinforce reasons to eat that are related to appetite and self-regulation. And these are factors that really do contribute to lifelong healthy development and weight status. So as mentioned, we are hosting a webinar next Thursday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. Atlantic time. 
where we will be sharing more information about our research on responsive feeding in the maritime provinces, as well as going more into depth into strategies for responsive feeding. You can register for the webinar through the link in the description for this video. Thanks so much.